That's David Axelrod and Holy Thursday in the background. We hope you enjoyed yourself today. I'm sorry you had to put up with everybody's colds and all that kind of stuff and being hoarse and loss of voice and all that. Yo. Peter, Paul, and Mary leaving on a jet plane number 35 in the year 1969. That's the way it was in 1969. Number 34 was the Sir Douglas Quintet in Mendocino. We're 1003 right now. Billy Bass taking you just a little bit closer to number one. And the year 1970, or the year one, with Nielsen, number 33. 95 tunes, man. Still, there's nobody doing chops like uh, Procol Harum. Still, there'd be more. It's uh, from Procol Harum's home album, and it was banned. It's Smoke Signal from Cahoots. This is Billy on the And Listen. now, direct from Los Angeles, the return engagement of one Mr. Billy Bass. You are now listening to, on WMMS, The Billy Bass Show. time it was called race music and then a guy by the name of um, uh, what was his name uh, Webster uh, Wexler Jerry Wexler Jerry Wexler called it rock and roll and then Alan Freed goes on the radio and he calls it rock and roll but rock and roll really started in the jukeboxes and the um, in the bars jukeboxes you remember those right I, don't know. I got into I, it was weird how I got into the DJ business I never aspired to be a DJ I'm a record guy really records is what I love I just love the sound of records and I got a job early in life at, at FW Woolworths luckily there were some kids in Nashville Tennessee who were brave enough to sit in at the, uh, the, the lunch counter at Woolworths uh, Woolworths was doing their best to hire somebody black, and so I was available, you know, and I got that job. <laughs> but anyway, I got this job at Woolworths, and, and uh, the manager, I was an assistant manager, and the manager told me to take over the book department and the record department. So now I'm learning how to be a merchandiser. In the now, how old were you? Just oh, I'm young. This is like 22, maybe 21. Very right. records. 
Then I opened up a record store called the Music Grotto for, for uh, Stark Records. So uh, Pat McCoy, who was the program director of WHK-FM, had this mandate that he had to start playing uh, music on the station because that's the way the FCC was working at the time. And they decided to emulate WNEW in New York. So Pat McCoy comes to the music uh, to the music writer and says, I don't know anything about this music, but you do. Would you go on the radio and just play something? I said, I don't know how to do that. And he said, you don't have to know, just play what you like. And so I got, this is how lucky I am. I got a job playing the music that I like. It was so fabulous. So Aretha Franklin, I would play Aretha Franklin and Ray Charles along with, you know, Jefferson Airplane, and people like that. Says, I want you to come and be a DJ at Wixie Pro 60. Can you imagine that? I was so freaking scared because I had no training, and, and, and I'm working with guys who are from WLS in Chicago and uh, WABC in New York in this format, but what I did do was skip over Ryan Highland and get to the Temptations. Yeah. Uh, WCR was great because we had, we had total freedom to do whatever we wanted to do. And I had Martin Crowley going who was, uh, he, he, he was a, let's call him a progressive rock kind of guy. Martin Crowley was on WCLB here in Cleveland before. He was the first, one of the first, him and Doc Nemo, underground DJs in town. They, they were the, uh, the, the trendsetters. They were the, the they, they, they wrote the book on how to do this, and we just followed them. But they were really, really good. But NCR was a great radio station. We had People's Radio. We discovered a great talent. Her name was Shauna Zerberg. Does you, before anybody remember Shauna? Yeah, Shauna was just amazing. We, yeah, David knows her. David was working on the station. So we had a great radio station for a while. So David and I and Martin and Shauna said, OK, see you. And we went over to WMMS and started the whole, the whole WMMS as you know it today. But most of you all know it as the buzzer. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I was at MMS with David and Martin and Shona up to and including the David Bowie years. Okay. So, so after NCR, we we take our our format to WMMS, and I would I would imagine that we really laid the foundation for WMMS. We played great music. And, and I was program director, and I had that, that same idea. Just hire the best DJs and let them do what they wanted to do. And, and David was so good at, 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 at finding hit records and playing those, those pop records that could fit our format. You know, he was a Beatle fan, I was a Beatle fan. Beatles sounded great on WMS. Shauna actually was, uh, I'll tell you a Shauna story, my favorite Shauna story. Shona actually, she was a singer-songwriter type DJ. So we heard we heard uh, Joni Mitchell and Green Powers. We heard a lot of good music from Shona. And then Martin played a lot of progressive rock like ELO and uh, Emerson Lake and Palmer and Yes and those kind of records. And I was really the rock and roll guy. I played mostly rock and roll and R and B records. Um, so we had a nice little mix of people. So, yeah. We're, we're trying our best. We, we really didn't know what to do. I mean, the only person on the station that knew how to do any kind of radio was Denny. Denny was our, our music director. He, he knew radio. We didn't know that. We were just having fun. <clears throat> but Shauna was troubled by the fact that she had this really sexy voice, that she was really good looking. And the, and the calls that were coming in were just the most. So Shauna is on the air. She, she's getting harassed by these phone calls. I mean, it's just the worst, I mean, the, the worst kind of behavior you can imagine. And, with, and she was putting up with it and putting up with it and putting up with it. And, and it was starting to get to her a lot, you know. And I didn't want to lose her because I knew what a talent she was. So one day, I'm, you know, we all listen to each other's radio say, I love listening to David in the morning. Love listening to Denny in the afternoon. You know, we, that we kind of played the radio station for each other. That, that we were our audience. So if I could make him happy, I knew you guys would be happy. So we, it was sort of like that. So I'm sitting at home listening to Shauna's show. And all of a sudden, I hear Shauna in this very sexy voice. 
She says, listen guys, come real close to the radio. I want to talk to you. Get real close. Okay, are you there? I want you to know, I'm not interested in you. Have your sister call me. Well, the next day the phone was ringing off the hook. I mean, so, uh, and I think I, I, I'm giving her credit for that. You know, that was the beginning of us getting an audience because we broadened ourselves. We started having game liberation news on the air. We started doing a whole lot of different stuff because we had somebody of the talent like Sean. We're, we're sort of, you know, 1969 happened, the Altamont happened. The Rolling Stones here, but you guys know that story. So the, our kind of hippie peace and love flavor that we had was kind of dwindling. You know, the audience was getting you know more rock and roll than ruckus, and I wasn't into it. I wasn't digging it. I was not happy playing anything that had anything to do with raising the uh, Confederate flag. And these and these songs. Uh, Leonard Skinner and groups like that, they were getting real popular, and I, I just didn't want to play. <clears throat> so, I was desperately looking for something to put on the radio to make a transition from Grateful Dead, Jefferson Starship, or, you know, into something new. And um, Denny Sanders came into, my, into the studio once and asked me to listen to Hunky Dory. So, I listened to the record and I said, Denny, this is it. This is just what we did. And you know, it took a while, but we, we played Hunky Dory and people started liking it and liking it. And the next thing you know, David Bowie, Jules Belkin, and uh, the, the uh, I would say the, the press here, everybody was involved in this David Bowie thing, especially the record stores. So the record store started stocking David Bowie. We were playing David Bowie. The Belkins were booking David Bowie. We had this, it was just a, a locomotive going. And, and it, was, it got so big that they, the, when David Bowie came to Cleveland, he played the music hall, the first show, sold it out right away. And that was not enough. About a month later, he came back, the Belkins brought him back. Did two shows at Public Auditorium sold out right away. I went, I sold the, the radio business, and, and because of the David Bowie thing, RCA, well, it wasn't really David Bowie, it was, uh, um, what was that, the organ player? What? The organ player, what's his Brian Hart. Brian Hart. <laughs> yeah, but, thanks to MMS again, one of the first jobs I had at, at RCA was to uh, promote Brian Auger. And David and WMMS played Brian Auger. And, and that record broke out of Cleveland. Again, when uh, Cleveland doing his job again. So um, RCA said, well, if you can do that, what I want you to do is go to, this, this sounds like the worst job in the world. Go to, this is, remember this is 1972. Go to Dallas, Texas, and do the same thing in Dallas, Texas that you did in Cleveland on the day. So I went to Dallas, and I figured, well, I'll just get every freak, every weirdo, every transvestite, every person, everything, every weird, every person in Dallas, Texas that was on the out, you know, that people in Dallas, Texas. <laughs> now I'm a real big shot. The next thing I know, I'm in New York. Working for us here, which was kind of cool. So before I go, to Luther, I leave RCA and go to Hollywood. You know, you know Hollywood. You know. <laughs> and the first thing I do is I get lucky and get and get a cast as the voice in the, in the movie Car Wash. So that was. Then uh, uh, I started working for a small record company called Chrysalis Records. It, it, they, they really specialized in albums. They had Robin Trower, Jeff O'Toole, and Roy Gallagher. Not no real big hits except for Jeff O'Toole. But they never had any singles. Excuse me. And in, in the 70s, Top 40 Radio really grew up and it was really, really big. So you had to have a single. And, you know, a hit record. Hit records were what it was all about. Well, that, that was trouble because none of our artists had records that were going to go on the radio until we uh, signed a kid out of Canada by the name of Nick Gilder. 
and he did a song called Hot Child in the City. Yeah. Well, luckily for me, I was had a promotion when that when when that record was handed to me to get it played on radio stations around the country. Well, it took me six months, but I did get that record to number one. So it was the first number one record. Okay, so that was the setup. Now here's the here's the here's the punchline. So now this is ten years later, maybe fifteen years later. I'm in LA being a big shot. Now I'm I'm not senior vice president at, at Christmas Records. I'm way up there, and uh, we're at this big party for for a uh, Dolly Parton, and I was invited to the party. I'm on this side of the room, and way over there on that side of the room, I hear somebody going. Billy! <laughs> Billy! And I couldn't believe it. And the, and the, and the, the party just came to our call. It just stopped. And she comes to the <laughs> uh, I mean, you talk about making somebody's day. Oh my God. <laughs> that was just the best day. Anyway, on my way to church on Sunday, I passed this sanctified church. And the music coming out of that church, I mean, they were hand clapping, the, oh my God, the, the, I heard a Hammond B3 organ for the first time, uh, you know, guitars were playing, people were hollering and screaming and shouting and dancing, it was the coolest thing ever. You know, and mass was at 9 o'clock, and I'm supposed to be there, but I'm sitting on the stump, I'm definitely not going in, because if you go in, you're definitely going to hell, ain't going to hell. <laughs> But I'm sitting out on the stump listening to this music, and every Sunday I would get, you know, penalized for not showing up to Mass. But did you go to Mass? I would tell my Aunt Jane, yeah, I went, yeah, I went. Never went. I was sitting on that stoop listening to that music coming out of there. So that really was my foundation. I heard the best music I ever heard right out of that sanctified church. All right, very cool. Let's well, and the, and after Christmas, I was kind of a, 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 a you know, I would call it image consultant. I was designing acts for record labels. And then I got hooked up with, the, oh, I got fired by Christmas. I forgot that part. <laughs> I got fired by Christmas because the president was hitting on somebody that I didn't like and yeah, it was one real thing. But anyway, he got fired and the owner of Christmas hired me back. So I, he got fired, and then I got back to Christmas, and then now I'm working at Christmas again in New York. I left LA, and went back to New York to work, and I get a call from the godfather of R&B, Clarence Avon. Does anybody know that name? Yeah. So Clarence Avon calls me up and says, "I want you to come and manage um, uh, Taboo Records." Denny so, Sanders called me back here. <laughs> Denny, Denny, Denny called, had, said, "Come back. We want you to work at Magic." I'm sorry, I did it. By the way. Yeah, because I, I just couldn't feel it. I wasn't, you know, I tried to do a certain thing and they, they wanted something else and it just wasn't working. That's why I was trying to figure out what am I going to do next. And I always loved taking pictures and I was an amateur photographer. So I went to Tri C, met Cindy. We, went, we learned Photoshop together. And I created Billy, uh, Billy Bass Photography and, and did. Uh, 200 weddings, 20 weddings a year for 10 years straight. Wow. Holy God. And Cindy, Cindy went on and made her business and put her husband. And just, we just had a great old time. Uh -huh. <laughs> Billy, uh, very honored that you agreed to do this tonight. Uh, the music box is indebted to you. Everybody, uh, he'll hang around and answer court. Uh, other questions over here. Almost the entire family did not heckle at all. <laughs> Thank you for coming. Be safe going home, everybody. Uh, again, in two weeks, we're going to have backstage at Blossom. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks for coming. I know it's a beautiful place to come. And you guys made me so great. I love you. Love you all.